fear that we fear that they have something out that the majority of the people don't know about. Ey ulan bizim halkların hakları gibi haklar. Ne aşağı ne yukarı. Ne fazla ne az. Pent up feelings that, that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime. A lot of killers. You get a lot of killers. Why well, do you think our country is so innocent? But I won't attack it because someone fixed me up. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles. Welcome to Varm Vlog, and today we're with my old friend Mir Ebal um, uh, in Sweden, and we're going to talk about uh, a bunch of things. Um, what the the American obsession with the Nordic countries, the the insistence somehow that the Nordic countries are still somehow super social democratic. Um, actual conditions in Sweden, what the political situation there looks like. And then, you know, we planned this for a couple months, and then uh, uh, the bear awoken, um, as one might say, over in Russia, and the Russia-Ukraine crisis happened. And while we're not going to focus on that, um, I've done far too much on it already, and uh, reading world news, I think any, um, any pontification on the likely outcome of that is way premature. Um, we do have to touch on some of the things that's changed in the European press and Swedish press in particular, and in Swedish politics, such as the revival of the Sweden Democrats, um, which is a party that is uh, a populist right party. One might even say that elements of it are post fascist in some way, post Nazi, um, yeah, uh, post Nazi, yeah, uh, uh, because basically the founder of the Swedish Democrat was mm. uh an unapologetic former SS volunteer who, ah. who, who volunteered for the SS. Okay, so, so uh, a collaborator. Um, yeah, he, like, a, a Swedish guy who traveled to Germany to, like, literally fight with the Nazis. So, as a side note, you and I have talked off air, but I do think we should talk about it on air. Mm -hmm. There is a small section of the American left uh, who tend to also be sympathetic to what what is often called in America corporatism or integralism, mm -hmm. um, and they don't know what the historical meaning of those words are here, so people don't don't tense up when they hear them. But um, we we've had uh, a couple of people. Um, around Angela Nagel, um, most specifically Malcolm Swayuna, who are who are attached to the think tank Oikos, who mm. w claim to speak to the American left or the American Marxist movement for some reason. Some of them, one of them became famous in particular for commentary he did about two years ago on Bernie Sanders. Um, and I bring it up because. Oikos is explicitly attached. It, it is not the same as, and it's not only Sweden Democrats in it, but it's ex explicitly attached to the Sweden Democrats. So what, before we get to the social Democrats, mm -hmm. it, it, uh, which by the way, the Sweden Democrats have nothing to do with really. Mm -hmm. um, before we get to the social Democrats in Sweden and the misunderstanding of things like the minder plan, um, we need to talk about uh, what, happened with the kind of new radical right in Sweden. How was a party associated with with a collaboration um, revitalized and made safe and sometimes even branded in the West as if it's less sympathetic or populist sympathetic in a in a non scary way? Mm. Um. I can begin with the personal anecdote. Uh, my father is a political refugee from Kurdistan, so I have mixed heritage. And uh, I grew up in the Swedish suburbs, which is the projects. 
uh, the and I grew up in the most segregated city in Europe during that time, which was Gothenburg. Uh, and that was the most segregated city in the whole of Europe among et ethnic lines during the 90s. Uh, and when I was growing up, Antifa uh, pat patrolled my daycare center because the Swedish Democrats was beating up children. Okay, so I that's the kind daddy. of party we're dealing with here, yeah. Yeah, it was during the 90s. Uh, think Golden Dawn. Uh, okay. Uh, they, so, yeah. they elected a new uh, party leader who made the classical move of we are all reformed and none of that shit ever happened. Uh, that was other people. And so France. like the Front National in France, like yeah, after, exactly. after Marine Le Pen replaced good old man Le Pen, you had this whole cleanup of the image and less explicit uh, references. I mean, in some ways, even like the way the Brexit party in the UK, like, uh, um, replaced uh the front national uh of the british national party um as you know which was also founded by people who were not collaborators but would have, would have loved to have been collaborators yeah so um i think people underestimate how thorough the cleanup was because i mean in so much that anyone in america knows about like marine le pen and the name comes up in the popular media enough that, you know, the average person has no idea who she is, but politicos might have some clue. Um, the, the, the history of the, of the front national is not well understood here. We just know that they are pretty far right. Um, and the history of the Sweden Democrats isn't understood at all. No. Um, uh, it was a, Interestingly, the first time I heard about the, the Sweden Democrats was not in the context of uh, the left or right divisions, but in debates about immigration and Islam mm. in the new, in the new atheist community in the late aughts. Mm. Um, and there's also uh, the Sweden Democrats are mentioned as where is uh, uh, the, a, a kind of populist group out of Norway. Um, because of their anti-Islamic sentiment, and there were people around like Richard Dawkins, not Richard Dawkins himself, I won't tar him with this, who um, thought we should be somewhat sympathetic to these parties, but they they uh, they painted it solely on like freedom of expression, freedom of religion, uh, freedom of religious lines, freedom of, of religious terrorism, and stuff like that. No mention of any of the ethnic uh, or racial animus there yeah. um, um i think the uh, comparison to front national is a good one uh because one thing that both those parties have in common is because they have a national socialist origin mm -hmm. uh, they for the longest time had a left-leaning economic politics as well and both though both those parties has since they became big, uh, cleaned that out uh, in dur during the same time as they have refreshed their image. So now they are economically part of the neoliberal center or even uh, the, the right word, pure economics of the neoliberal center. Ah, uh, yeah. So, um, and I think people need to understand, like, this is not a small party. This is no. what, like, eighteen percent of the Swedish population or Swedish electorate uh, identifies with it in some way, form, or fashion. Yeah, uh, uh, now it is between eighty and twenty-four, pro eighteen and twenty-four percent, depending on which poll you look at. This Ukraine stuff has tossed that up in the air uh, because they have have very strong ties with uh, Russia. Uh, 
uh, their party leader for probably 20 years now, Jim, Jim Wokeson, uh, famously refused to answer the question who he preferred, Emmanuel Macron or Putin, or Joe mm-hmm. Biden or Putin. Well, so 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 the Sweden Democrats may face the same. Uh, for Americans to understand this, and my audience isn't just American. It's, uh, I mean, I even have some Russians in my audience. Uh, well, I did until last week. Yeah. Um, now they can't patronize me. Um, but regardless, um, it is quite similar in some ways. The 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 way that the Sweden Democrats might be somewhat discredited by this is the, similar. Ironically, to the way um, Gerhard Schroeder in Germany has been somewhat both discredited and put back into the spotlight. Weirdly, I never thought I'd hear that name again after <laughs> 2005. Um, he was by when, when I lived in Europe, which was only for nine months of my life. Um, I'm not particularly Euro inclined, as people may know about me. I like to start shit with Europeans. It's, it's like a hobby of mine. Um, but... <laughs> Um, I was there during, uh, Schroeder's, uh, tenure, um, in 2000, um, as an exchange student. And so I'm familiar with that period of the SP day. Um, but, but in America, Trump's, uh, perceived friendliness to Russia. And I say perceived because during the Trump administration, um, the rhetoric towards Russia was good, but we are actually still passing a bunch of sanctions. Uh, the GOP were leading that charge. Um, uh, so we have, um, so we have that. And what you've seen in America is while Trump hasn't suffered a massive popularity hit yet, um, although it does seem like he suffered some, um, the GOP has started attacking him openly in the last mm-hmm. week in a way you haven't seen in a while. Um, or, or, or not entirely openly, but like so thinly veiled that, you know, anyone could have seen it. Um, so there's that problem. I, I do think it's interesting, though, because uh, a lot of the European right has been hit by this. Hmm. Um, at least the European, not center right, but further right, the, yeah. the you know the national the national conservatism and uh, uh, in various nationalist factions have been somewhat friendly to Putin, um, as mm-hmm. have certain left wing parties as well. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, it's been hard to see how that's gone. What what I wanted to push you like I'm not a person who is uh. No, if, if before people attack us, I'm not pro Russia here, but I've been following how anti Russian coverage has gotten in various places. And while it's impossible to quantify, um, uh, while it's impossible to quantify, um, it's it's been something that I've really thought about, um, is that. I kind of expect the American press to be somewhat bellicose, although the American press actually, while it's been totally pro-Ukrainian in, in, in a way that is slightly distorting, and I say this as a person who's very sympathetic to anybody fighting, you know, people shelling their homes. I'm not, this is not me uh, taking a pro-Russia line here. Um, but I have been like, okay, you do have to admit, though, there are right wingers in the Ukrainian military and this, like and stuff like that. Like um, the the European coverage has it's actually wild. has actually uh, now now I've only really been following the British and somewhat the German press, and the German mm. press is not has not been the German press is more divided. Um, but the you were telling me that the Swedish press, because of and I I I know the history, but I'll let you recap it for my yeah. audience, um, uh, has historical reasons for being particularly anti-Russian. And I've known a lot. I've even known a lot of very good leftists that I trust mm-hmm. in Sweden who have a weird soft spot for NATO, given that Sweden's not in it. 
yeah. because of their fears of Russia. Can you talk about why the Swedish press may have taken such an anti-Russian stance and and what may be driving that? Yeah, uh, this, uh, this anti-Russian stand in Sweden is extreme. Like you, you quoted the British press and the British press is tame in comparison to uh, the Swedish. In Sweden, even the uh, public sector broadcast, the NPR, uh, basically, uh, is basically mongering for war. Every, everybody's across the board. There are no exceptions within the uh, Swedish media sphere at all. Uh, perhaps the neo reactionary Malcolm Shuna uh, is probably the only one which has been criticizing that at all. Yeah, but, but we just mentioned that he has ties to Orcos and the Sweden Democrats, so of course he would be... Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, he wouldn't be... Uh, but I do, I do want to find... I do want to ask, though, why hmm. then... I know that during the first 24 hours, actually, of the Ukrainian uh, military operation... Oh, Sweden, this was long before that. Like, like even in the three or four months leading up to the invasion, there was warmongering. Hmm. So, and that now, has, why is that? Because a Sweden, yeah. First, historical. In Sweden, we have this this expression, "ryskrecken," uh, the fear of the Russian. Uh, because Sweden was a great colonial power during the 16th and the 17th century in Europe. Uh, we, were, we were one of the great Ju Ju European powers. Yeah, on top with, with people France. forget that there's like a Swedish empire that was actually fairly oh, yeah. big that went into like Poland, Lithuania and all that. Yeah. And uh, all of Germany and large parts of Russia as well. Uh, and during, I think it was 1809, the last big war with the Russian war. I can't remember that wrong. But basically, the, the Russians did the scorch uh, tactics on half of Sweden, the northern part. Uh, and that was only 200 years ago. That is, it is a long time, but it's still uh, my my grandmother shared stories of her of her grandmother and so on so it is within uh, within the oral memory yeah exactly so that's one part the second part is purely economical sweden is a large exporter of weapons mm. we we have a very highly developed uh, mil military industry to some, uh, and uh, we are actually selling weapons to not Ukraine officially yet, uh, but it will come. Uh, so basically, uh, and the weapon industry has very large ties to the social democrats uh, and to the main right wing parties. All right, so let's go over the mm -hmm. the parties in uh in Sweden. So there's the Social Democrats, which all Americans think all the Nordic Social Democrats are like super cool. They're commies, but they never had to hurt anybody, so they're like pure commies. No, um, I mean I'm being I'm being facetious, but um, there is an obsession in the American left with 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 the Swedish. Social Democrats. But what's also fascinating and, and what people, what I find fascinating about how this can coexist in America in the same political discourse, the libertarian right, which has admittedly been in decline the last 15 years, also really loves Sweden. Yeah. Uh, they love, they love the school reforms. You know, the, uh, they love the, <laughs> they love the universal armament for militia. <laughs> They love, um, or what they think that is that anyway. They love, um, they love the COVID policies. Um, so 
how is it that Sweden in particular mm -hmm. can somehow be a model to to uh, the American left for things? Although it's funny because they'll say stuff like, um, we need a, a minimum wage like in Sweden. And I'm like, the Nordic countries don't, don't have, have minimum, minimum wage. wage. <laughs> um, so like, it's like, you don't understand how, no, the unions are just so powerful in Sweden that they don't really, they don't really need it. But yeah. no, they don't have a minimum wage. Neither and does... the unions do not protect guest workers. Right. So so this is the other thing. Um, I've seen studies that talked about guest workers and other immigrants in, in the Nordic countries and the conditions that apply to the poorer sectors of the American workforce are still in the Nordic economies. They're just in guest workers. Um, yeah, who don't and have the union protections. Worse, worse, because since so much is relied on the unions, uh, Sweden don't have. We have a lot of protections by law for workers, but then guest workers are outside of a union. They are more vulnerable than most guest workers are in the U.S. I would say. Uh, when right, father, although we have a whole sector of the gray and black economy that you don't have, oh, yeah, but, and, yeah, but yeah. yeah, 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 and and we have to. Uh, okay, you do have a you do have large sections of illegal uh, oh, of yeah. uh, of undocumented and thus illegal labor. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. Uh, that is a big prob pr problem. A couple of of years ago, like there was this fruit picking company who drove in. 300 Romanians, I think, to the middle of of the northern parts of Sweden, mm -hmm. and just left them there without paying any wages at all. And they had to sleep in tents for three or four months. When when my father my father's first job in Sweden, this was in the 80s, uh, was picking fruit for one dollar an hour all right so what i find interesting so so people need to under, i think people also need to understand this about sweden and uh and russia uh mm -hmm. uh sweden and russia's economy is actually in gdp terms about the same size yeah um which which given the difference in population and, and uh and resource capacity means that sweden is in an economically better off position uh sweden has um compared to the united states um very good uh income equity very good economic competitiveness even which is something that a lot of people don't think is possible um good human development decent protection of civil liberties although i i think it's overstated in the west how good they are from what i've read from swedish sources in english um, but that's, but the, you know, quality of life is pretty good. Yeah. Um, for most people, for most people, right. Um, there are people outside of it, but I think people, there are large groups outside of it. We shouldn't, uh, and that is something that is missed. Uh, the, the latest statistics is that one in every 10 child grow, grow in Sweden grows up under the, the poverty line. Oh, so that that's that's like okay, what is it? We're one in every five or something, which is worse. But I mean, like, but yeah, but it, 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 it's the European poverty line, and in Sweden we have free education and free healthcare, and uh, and all the students get free lunch at school. Right. So it is different, but so that poverty line means that it's usually single mothers who who don't eat themselves so that the kids can eat basically All right so we have we 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 have a situation where things are good compared to uh north america um in general yeah but i think that sometimes leaves us to overstate or misunderstand what's actually going on in sweden yeah, um, which is a brutal neoliberalization. Uh, and I want to return to the question that you asked 
how come that both libertarians and uh, mm -hmm. uh, and social democrats love Sweden? Uh, well, the social democrats because they live in the idea of Sweden in the early eighties, basically, uh, and when the when the seventy recession oil oil recession hit Sweden, we managed to basically stave it off for a couple of years. But during the late eighties and especially the nineties, we saw a big neoliberalization. And since we had had basically from the nineteen thirties to two thousand and and six uninterrupted social democratic government with the exception of like four years in the 70s uh, with the center party which is basically the the farmers party mm -hmm. uh, the social democrats had built up a very strong state and and incorporated the unions into the state so uh, when you are active in a union in Sweden, you are doing the work of the employer. You are actually, as a union representative, sitting with HR com complaints and 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 helping your um, your employers sort those HR complaints out. Okay. Uh, so, and when. But when the neoliberal wave hit, we had everything under the guise of the state. And the social democratic state had uh, waged war upon civil society because civil society was church-driven and conservative. So Sweden in, in Sweden, the biggest church was a part of the state until the year 2000. Okay. We, we only separated church and state in the year 2000. Uh, so we had a secretary of, a, of, ecclesia, of, of ecclesiology uh, up until then. Uh, so when so all the civil society was crushed under the social dem democrats by the time, uh, and everything was run through the states and the municipalities. So when you then want to introduce neoliberal reforms, mm. there are no parts of civil societies or unions to fight back. Because the unions and, are incorporated into the state. Exactly. So instead of, I don't know, cre creating charter schools whole cloth, mm. you can just change a law. And all of a sudden, all all of the state apparatus shifts 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 gears into running uh, private as private companies, and that is what we did. Our school charter system is the most liberal in the world. Yeah, even more than the United States, which is why. Oh, yeah, much yeah. more than, than than the United States. For the longest time, we were at the same par with Mexico, mm. uh, but uh, but we are worse than Mexico now. Uh, Pinochet tried to make the Swedish charter charter school reform under the Chicago Boys, but it was too bonkers, even for Pinochet. To be able to drive it through. That's how neoliberal it is. Well, it's funny. I always tell this story about how I became a Marxist. And a lot of it is is always, you know, whatever you talk about how you become to any ideology or religion, you, if, unless it's what you were born in, there's, you know, a conversion story. And the conversion story is almost inherently bullshit, right? Because there's many, many yeah. things that made you what you are. But there is a moment in my mind when it clusterized for me. And it was actually reading. You're going you're gonna to find this funny. Naomi Klein's book, in defense of Keynesian social democracy and 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 all this yeah. and, and and her shock doctrine, and in the book, she she basically uses the shock doctrine theory, all right, to explain 
what happened with uh, all with, with even like Noriega's uh, Sandinistas in, yeah. in, in, in you know in Nicaragua. Like, why did so many of these left governments neoliberalize? Now, I know that people don't really know what neoliberalization is. They think it's just capitalism, and I also know that a lot of people think that a lot of governments aren't neoliberal that are. Uh, not just when we talk about the neoliberalization of the social democracies of Scandinavia. Uh, and and w- we should also like, like when somebody was like, <laughs> somebody was telling me, well, all that the EU offers is neoliberalism, but what about Russia? And I'm like, what do you think Russia is going to offer? Also, like, actually, it's not even going to be neoliberalism. Actually, no, it's going to it's gonna be just klepto liberalism, frankly. But, um, but and that is the greatest difference between the right wing and the and the social democrats in Sweden, actually, because the social democrats have been driving through these uh, neoliberalizing reforms, which are basically private private company who does welfare work for free, but get paid by the government and can take out unlimited profits, which they then place in. Uh, in tax paradises and don't have to tax for. Right. Uh, so, and the difference yeah. between the right wing and the left wing parties are basically that the social democrats are a little bit more competent in their neoliberalization and the right wing basically just sell them to themselves and their friends. So not that different from the difference between the Democrats and the Republicans in the United States in some ways. No. Um but again, we're starting from a different baseline. I think people need to understand this yeah. because, like, we're not saying that Sweden is the United States. It's not. Um, so I've always there, there's this there's this obsession in in social democratic circles. I think every two years I see another article in Jacobin about this, where the, the Rain uh, uh, Meadner model. Our, mm-hmm. our program is is discussed as like a godsend that we can implement. Um, now, one that I that I think it always misses right is like the the Rain Meador model is 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 a Marxist Keynesian hybrid model focused mostly on Keynesian economics, not Marxist yeah. economics, and and two, um, which was geared at low inflation. And we need to talk about that mechanism because if people actually understand that, I think they'll see even the Ray Minor model as more pernicious than they realize. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, but and that model yeah. was also explicitly used by the Social Democrats to crush the, the left opposition. Right. Basically, full employment, but suppression of wages to knock down inflation. And, and suppression of wages done by the unions themselves. Yeah, so it made the unions complicit in and thus less popular leading to the political crisis of the 70s, right? That yeah. that which needs to be fully understood. Um and so but this was the, the reason why this was justified is and even in sold to people mm. is that the progressive taxation it and redistribution of social goods would offset anything that would come from the wage stagnation to keep inflation down. That's how this was sold. And, but, and to be yeah. fair, that actually kind of worked. Right. It, it, it did seem to work for about 20 years. Now, longer. I mean, okay. uh, up until the 80s, I, I would say, uh, because the 70s crisis, oil crisis hit Sweden, but it didn't hit it super hard. Our biggest crisis was it was the IT uh, debacle in the 90s. That has hit us hard. That hit us harder than the 2008 depression. So, so, so you would argue, and I think there's some facts about this up. That I, I think it's interesting that while there was a business cycle in Sweden, meaning capitalism, and yeah. and, and people don't know what I mean by that, but when when I say if a country has a business cycle. It is operating like a capitalist country. Yeah. And I always point out that a lot of countries that people call socialist have business cycles that operate mm-hmm. exactly the same as, as business cycles in a capitalist country. But what I do find interesting is that the, during the, the post-war social compact, mm-hmm. more than in Western Europe or in the United States, 
but all I will say this: all of these areas had mitigation of the business cycle from 1949 till about 1962. Uh, there was a business cycle in the United States, but Fordism actually also tamped down on it. Um, it was not as severe. Um, uh, but it does look like while the business cycle wasn't removed in Sweden during the, the heyday of uh, the Ray Minor model, no. it was controlled in a way yeah. it was not in Western Europe and the United States. Like you guys held on to things for 20 more years that the rest of us lost. Yes, uh, and that is, well, basically, Europe is the supplier of ore for all of Europe. Mm. So that's a big part of it. Okay, uh, so like with Norway, Sweden is an extract has an, a pretty heavy extractive economy. Yeah, both in ore and in lumber. Okay. Uh, and if you compare, like, because Sweden is the most neoliberal of the Nordic countries by far. By far, which is interesting because in some ways Sweden's also was the one where the Social Democrats had the most complete victory. Yes, <laughs> so and I would claim that that is why because the Social Democrats' victory depended on crushing so the the civic societal foundations, uh, like the Chinese paradox uh, when the Cultural Revolution happened, all the social fabric of uh, of civil so society was cramped out to uh, make the brutal neoliberalization later easier because the social foundations of social relationships were no longer there because in Sweden almost all social relationships was mediated either by the state or by the unions. Mm. So in some ways... And, we and, talked about this years ago, actually, on your podcast, and we talked yeah. about it in English, but the, the dual power model in Sweden really worked. However, when this in the 50s, when the Social Democrats became pretty much effectively, nonviolently through a totally, you know, they didn't even have to get rid of the constitutional monarchy. No. Like, we, uh, we are still a monarchy. Right, exactly. Like, so... And we had... Uh, and we didn't separate the state from the church until year 2000. That That is insanely late. So so the Social Democrats were able to take over the parliamentary apparatus completely, fairly, I think pretty much bloodlessly. Um, uh, and, um, and because they had this dual power model, all these institutions they built up were then immediately incorporated into yeah. the Swedish state. And that um, happened in... Well, basically in the 30s. Uh huh. Uh, and it was after the uh, Cossack election in Sweden uh, when, this, when the Swedish Communist Party to split 1917, as every other party did, uh, basically threw, threw the Social Democrats under the bus that the Social Democrats. Uh, basically out of resentment uh, began to, to saw it as their primary aim to crush the left opposition. All right. Uh, and the Reiner Mind of Model was aimed at the Swedish Communist Party but also at the Swedish Socialist Party which only existed uh, for... It was big in the 20s and the early 30s, uh, and then it disappeared uh, because, so, they, so, because so, they went full out Nazi after a while. But in the oh. beginning, they were the uh, liberal left, like they were communists, but they were between the two internationals because they didn't want to swear allegiance to Moscow. Right, um, so they didn't pick between the second and the third no. international, and uh, yeah, I. It's interesting though because uh, the the Israeli um, uh, stu uh, um, historian of nationalism, uh, Zev Steinhaus, yeah, Zev Steinhaus makes a big deal out of how many 
uh, of the Swedish Social Democrats moved to the Swedish Socialist Party and how many of them just became outright fascists. Like yeah. he uses them a lot to to show that uh, it wasn't just liberalism leading to fascism or Dude. conservatism leading to fascism. There really was a coalition of various elements in all the ideological strands, but they're pretty much... And you know, the Reinhardt model was basically used by the social dem democrats. And if you read their internal documents, mm -hmm. like none of this is translated into English, unfortunately, and none of the secondary literature. Yeah, that literature. doesn't surprise me. It's just even this, even the stuff from the SP Day isn't translated into English, yeah. Mir. Uh, like, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, but uh, basically, if you read the internal documents, uh, the Social Democrats were really afraid of the Socialist Party, who then disappeared, because they were not full-on uh, Stalinists, as the Communist Party was. So they had a broader appeal, because they had a lot of intel intellectuals, they they wanted to, to defend democratic freedoms, and, and they were a real radical left Social Democratic alternative. So the social democrats spent all their time crushing them. So to, can I, yeah. to the extent that during the Second World War, the social democrats built concentration camps in Sweden. Not the, not not uh, extermination camps, concentration camps where they put communists and and they were sent out in the fields to dig their own graves every day and said, tomorrow Hitler is going to come, and then we are going to shoot you. The Social Democrats did that in Sweden. So, we have to... Wow. Um, I didn't even know that. So, yeah. I also... I, I This history that we talked about, about the current situation with Sweden in mm -hmm. regards to its flirtations with NATO all of a sudden in the Swedish press, let us also ask, was that part of why the communist party in Sweden didn't have the same leg up as it did in, in, in other parts of central Europe. Was it, was it, was it because it was associated with animus towards the Russians? Like not the Bolsheviks, but the Russians in specific, or am I overreading that? I've never, I don't know. It just is, it's a, something yeah. I've always wondered. Uh, there I, I I have read almost all of the research on the Communist Party in Sweden, and there are none official research or no uh, or no mm -hmm. studies on it. I would say probably. Okay, so we just don't really know, but it, it would it, there would be a pattern because because the Communist yeah. Party is so associated uh, not with the with the histor with the German historical tendencies or the Austrian historical tendencies yeah. or even the Dutch. Historical tendencies of communists is associated with the Russians, exactly, and and uh, and the we and and the Communist Party in Sweden only got its heydays in the seventies when they elected Yalmar, uh, no, uh, yeah, uh, uh, a new party leader who officially broke with the Soviet Union. So in one sense, also, the Nordic countries avoided the, 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 uh, the split between the internationals that destroyed um, yeah. uh, the Central European left uh, outside of the Nordic countries. But in another way, it seems like this was it's still, still a problem. Caught in it. It's still caught in it. Uh, okay. Because basically, uh, up until the 70s, the, social, the, the Communist Party was... Paria. Okay, so the Communist Party was a pariah party because uh, because of their connections with Russia. Because their connections with Russia and and the the Swedish did the, did the, the in the fifties and sixties did the Swedish Social Democrats ever appeal to the pre-Soviet threat to the to the, you know to did no. they ever try to portray? Okay, they didn't do that. Okay, I was just wondering no. did it, they? But the is. Uh, but the Swedish right party did. Uh, oh, okay. So the Swedish right, the, like associated Swedish with the Sars party, party. The moderate and the center party did. The center party was Nazis. And uh -huh. now they are Clintonites. But during the 30s, they were literal Nazis. They had swastikas on their uh, uh, 
play kids and now they are a part of the center left coalition for some reason <laughs> uh, because because of of historical contingencies uh, but well basically up until the 90s uh, the swedish right wing party was was connected with the old Ar aristocracy and the hatred toward democracy yeah, so it was a blood and soil monarchist party, basically. Well, not blood and soil, and not so much so much monarchist as the old gentry. Okay, so so this is, but this is an appeal to a pre-modern class formation. Yes, a pre-modern a pre-modern class formation, not so much, but like because basically the Swedish gentry became the Swedish industrialists. Well, yeah, but that's kind of. That's kind of true everywhere, Mir, except yeah. for the United States. But because, uh, because yeah, our... but, but since Sweden is such a small country, it 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 becomes much more visible here. Oh, so it's not hidden like it is. Like uh, all of a sudden, in World War One, all the all all no. the heirs of the nobility all all suddenly marry into industry, and you know, no. um, and the ancien regime is crushed. But no. the people are now, yeah, okay, got it. Sweden wasn't in a war. Got it. Because Sweden stayed out of the war. Because of the neutrality, you didn't have that whole mechanism to hide the shift. No. Uh, Got it. And also because of the fact that, like, Sweden is an extremely Protestant country. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, and that lends itself very well to the Bayerian the idea of work ethics and the industrialization. Uh, so basically, the gentry was the one who was driving the gentrification and the intermarrying of the uh, gentry and the merging bourgeoisie in Sweden happened during the 1630s. So in Sweden, so like, like it's it's pre bourgeois revolutions, basically. Yeah, yeah, Got it. Yeah. So you guys didn't. It, because of neutrality and because it happened er actually early, not late. Um, the the whole ancien regime of being folded into the bourgeois regime happened explicitly instead mm. of implicitly, yeah. and early on. So, so in many ways, the Protestant, you know, gentry and aristocracy mm. could have been seen as also the bourgeoisie. Like, like yeah. there's a there's a true continuity there. That's yeah. That is interesting to think about how that would change a society because one of the things that I've always wondered about Sweden is like, and none of the Swedish person which I talk about know this history. Sw Swedish people know more about the American Civil War than 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 we do our own history. So, so you would agree with uh, with uh, Anton Jaeger, despite all of European about uh, Europeans anti-americanism somehow American culture has uh an American thus American history has become something of a cultural touchstone I, yeah I was confused by this actually this this yeah, is something to ask you especially true in Sweden if you compare it to other European countries because Sweden has never had a humanist tradition Sweden has since the 60s since and since basically the foundation of the Swedish state in the 15 in the early 15th century being a state of engineers and we did and since the priestly orders were incorporated into the state as functionaries we never had this humanistic uh, uh, a tradition of humanities we don't have any hum person in the humanity of noteworthy whatsoever. Our only international known scholars are Linnaeus, who was a botanist who invented racial theory, and also Alfred Nobel, who was a chemist. That's and, true, actually. Uh, I'm thinking about that. I don't know that many Swedish novels. You, you guys produce poets now, but not, <laughs> not, not many. We had a bunch of novelists in the, uh, in the 20th century, but those were working class. Right. But what you know, and those what, were explicitly tied to the working class dual power. 
So, so they were basically like our, our, our realist novelists in America, which were, they were yeah. working class, but they were about the working class and marketed to them. They just weren't written by them. But yeah. yeah but here uh, they were written by the working class. Right. Because you had a, the working class had enough education to be able to do it. And, and they, not to pump shit on the Americans, but are were actually good. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Shush. Shush. It, yeah. Yeah, but like our novels are better now. I'm just gonna say that. Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, they are, but like those, like if you look at Noah Martin. Oh no, um, the 19th century, uh, 19th century American realism, with the exception of Mark Twain and like some of the regionalist novelists, it's shit. It's uh, utter yeah, shit. They have Steinbeck. <laughs> Yeah, but that's but yeah, that's funny though because Steinbeck. I mean, we're on a literary tangent, and yeah. people don't know this is my day job. But but Steinbeck is a 20th century not modernist novelist who's actually a throwback yeah. to 19th century novelist, and and he and he yes he he's writing about the working class and 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 he's he's legitimately from it, but he's really late. And in America, we actually don't teach him as even part of that movement yeah. because he's so late. Um, and 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 it's weird, and we not even literally cliques because I, as well as you, are a poet, uh, and and I've had a bunch of stuff uh, published. So that's not my day job, but it's a hobby. Uh, but not even the poets and the literary cliques and the elites read these novelists now in Sweden. Very few people. I was about to say when I was reading. Uh... Also, but I have a bunch of uh, Swedish uh, poets in translation over here in my library, mm -hmm. and I am always amazed at how many American cultural references there are in them. I'm, oh, like, yeah. I'm like, I know all these cultural references. You didn't even have to give me footnotes. Like, no, because um, they are, because like there are not any Swedish references. Like perhaps Ingmar Bergman, but that's basically it. Because Ingmar Bergman basically killed Swedish culture for a very long time because he was such a giant and Sweden is such a small country, so he basically suffocated all the air. Yeah, and I, I do think about and, and not to get into cultural essentialism because I think it's bullshit, but I do think about like oh, even when I thought about that like like that Nordic Nor social democratic Nor movement that came to the United States like mm -hmm. uh, like um, ten years ago. Almost none of it was Swedish. It was all yeah. like Norwegian and Danish. So, yeah. um, and, and Norwegian, and to bring this back to politics a bit, but both Nor Norway and Denmark mm -hmm. are much smaller countries. They, yes. they are like half the size, if that of Sweden. That's that's what people. I I, I I'm gonna say this to be nice to Americans, but and it's not probably true of my audience. But Americans in general don't know geography. Mm. Um, we, we don't really teach it. I mean, honestly, in public school that much. No. Um, particularly European geography. I I have a theory as to why, because they really dropped it in the 70s. And I mm. think uh I think it was because the borders just kept changing and they couldn't <laughs> and we weren't spending money on I'm I'm serious, and we no. weren't spending money on school books, so we just gave it up. Um but I mean, even our own geography, like, uh, like you, it is not uncommon in, in a, for people who live on uh, on the Great Lakes to not realize that those are not oceans until they're in high school, because we don't teach geography very well here, and and like, you know, Sweden as part of the Nordic countries uh, is one thing. But people don't see that it's in a very different geographical position than Norway and Denmark. And I also think... And like, uh, Sweden is like, Sweden has natural resources. Norway has oil, but that's it. Uh, and uh, basically, Norway was a Swedish colony up until uh, 1905. A Swedish colony. And Finland was right. a Swedish colony up until like 18... 87 or something like that. Uh, so Sweden is the former, and we had a colony on, ha on Haiti as well. Uh, so Sweden is the former colonial power. Uh, but Sweden right. now has around 10 million inhabitants, uh, citizens, uh, closer to 11 now, I think, but they're around. And Norway has around five, and Denmark has around five. So like... Right. 
and and Sweden's also and that's it... why and that's why both Nor Norway and Denmark have been one of the reasons why they have been able to prolong the welfare stage much better than 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 the Swedish country because of scale and like also because of physical scale. Uh, now I now I live in the mid of of Sweden. Uh, only three months ago, I I worked in the utmost north north part of Sweden. The difference between the middle of Sweden and the north part of Sweden is the same difference as the middle of Sweden and like the south of Italy. Right, right, right. So because Sweden is so fucking large. Right. Although you're talking to an American here, and. Our country is stupid big, um, oh, yeah. but like it has a lot of inhabitants as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, this is the thing. Sweden is a large country that is eighty, what, like 80, 86, 87 percent urban, right? Like it's it's pretty yeah. it's pretty urban, um, but it 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 has a lot of the rules that you exp- that you have in larger countries that smaller countries don't have. And I'm I'm trying to get people to think about this because I've talked about this. I'm like, okay. Why was it so hard to get Russian infrastructure modernized or, frankly, American infrastructure modernized, even though after after World War II, the U.S. is the richest country in the world? And I'm like, it's fucking huge, and it's a big energy resource, and a lot of the areas are not actually that inhabited. Yeah. And, and that's actually also true for Sweden. So yeah, it's, it's Sweden came, came around that, because like after the Second World War, Mm-hmm. Uh, you you accumulated like all the wealth in the world, uh, but yeah. Sweden was like the only part of Europe which which wasn't involved in in the Second World War. I was about to say this, this is something Sweden else. Was... Yeah, Sweden because was we not... were neutral, which which meant that we were basically on the side of the Nazis uh, in practice. Uh, like we let their troops through, we deported Jews. Like the whole idea of having uh, the letter J stamped in Jewish passport was a demand from the Swedish government. Mm. The Swedish government had the first institute of racial biology in the world. Sweden invented racial science. Mm. First with Linnaeus, who was the first person who made race be something rooted in biology and not culture. And then in forms of politics uh, with, with, with the first racial institute. So I like, can't blame France anymore. No. Damn it. All right. Um... <laughs> and one thing to also remember, like because the Swedish Democrats first came into the parliament like in the late aughts mm-hmm. uh, or early tens. It, the, when did they found in the, in the 70s or 80s? 80s. Okay. Uh, and they came into 2012, if I don't remember right. I can get the year wrong, but around there, they, they enter parliament. So, so I know that, I know that most Americans think that Europe is a post-racial wonderland, um, and, which also just happens to be full of only white people. What happened? Like the difference in 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 demographic in 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 demography in in Sweden. When my mother was born, and my mother is quite young, she is in her. She is not sixty years yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, she had me young, so basically in the. In '62, in in Sweden, we had less than one percent immigrants in Sweden overall. Less than one percent who had not Swedish, like genetic origins, uh, not genetic, but uh, cultural, cultural genetics somewhere in there. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, and out of them who came from outside of Scandinavia or Germany, were less than. It, like I checked out the statistics, and in uh, 1960, it was 0.007 percent of the Swedish population who mm-hmm. came outside of uh, of Sweden, of the Scandinavian countries, uh, Germany, and the Netherlands. 
to today we are not allowed by law to make statistics of racial heritage in Sweden, it is illegal. So not even the state has it. Uh, but if you, the statistic that you can get says that uh, people who are either born outside of Europe or have one parent who is born outside of Europe, and that is pri primary from Africa, the Middle East, or Latin America, are around 25% of the population. Okay. So that is a that's a huge so, demographic shift. That's that's way faster than in than in the United States, which has yeah. still been pretty fast. Um I, I think it's interesting though, because I don't say this to the Swin to defend Sweden. Um because you guys are in Europe and you know how I feel about anyone in Europe. But um <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm kind of joking, audience. European audiences don't all quit watching. I don't hate you. Um, but I do. <laughs> but, and I'm uh, not allowed because I have my roots in the Middle East. <laughs> right. Um, but uh, I, I, Sweden is a paradox to me because of the Nordic countries, believe it or not, on, on, on survey after survey, you have a more positive view of immigrants than the other Nordic countries, but you also we have, have a, a but yeah, but it's not that high. What, what people, what people are surprised about is it's actually the positive view of immigrants is equal to the United States. Mm. And in fact, I'm actually going to say this, that's your, that the United States view of immigration, which is not super great is still actually better on average than anywhere in Europe. Yeah. Um, and like you, like Sweden's we, the exception that you're the same as us. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, sure, uh, the rest of the Scandinavian countries have better, have worse review of immigrants, but immigrants have easier time integrating. I, I, that's what I was about. That was the paradox. I was like, because Sweden is an extremely hard country to immigrate in. I was about Both to say it's, it's hard to get into Sweden. With labor laws, strong unions who act since uh, since uh, employment is based on weird arcane union re re relationships and that sort of stuff. It is really hard for immigrants to punch into the Swedish society, and since we have had. Uh, since the 80s under Olaf Palme, uh, which was our radical social democratic anti-imperialist prime minister who was assassinated. Yeah, he uh, was like the... He was venturing into actual kind of not just social democratic territory. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like prime... It is easy to overstate that uh, okay. because he all... Uh, in terms of politics in Sweden, he was a mixed bag uh, okay. because he left the economics very much to the proto-neoliberals. -neo uh, but he still thought privatization. But on foreign policy, he went up and called the president of the United States of America, Nixon, a motherfucking murderer. No, in direct television. Yeah, that's pretty. Yeah, <laughs> in Western Europe, that would that would have the that would have certain intelligence officers on your ass at that time. Yeah, like, and we still don't know who assassinated him. Fair uh, enough. <laughs> uh, I I don't think the U.S. had anything to do with it. I think it was a small clique of far right extremists within the police, uh, but that's not we we probably will never know for sure, uh, uh, because most of those people are dead now. He was assassinated. Also, in we could have easily given money to those far right extremists in the police. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> uh, and there are a recording of Nixon, uh, which the CIA. Uh, where, when, when Nixon heard what Ulf Palme said about uh, uh, 
uh, about the U.S. Uh, the CIA bleeped three minutes of conversations about what they had to pay. <laughs> oh, that I mean, I can respect that. Yeah. Um, so and but, but Olof Palme was like he actually like changed the Cuban consulate in uh, uh, during the Pinochet coup to a Swedish to a Swedish embassy to to help us to help political refugees and to help the left opposition get away. So like in foreign policy deals he supported ANC in South Africa and gave them weapons. He supported uh, the Vietnamese in in that sense he was a hero. But he also were very big on taking in refugees. And not economical refugees, but political refugees. And that later extended into uh, basically refugees from the Middle East and from North Africa, where we didn't take the people who had the most money, but take the people who needed it the most. And those people are generally really poor and really hard to assimilate, especially if they get some sort of state uh, state money. If you take a Somali, a, a Somali family, uh, and and they cannot read, and then and they get public services, and the father get by on black contract. There aren't much incentive for the mother to integrate or even to learn to learn the language, mm-hmm. and and that's a paradox because of our actually really humane policy of, about taking in the people who needed it the most. Those people have become really the refugees who came during the nineties and the two thousands were really hard to integrate. Mm. And so this led to a backlash, and thus the Swedish. Yeah. So, I mean, I also know the American right will like cite Swedish sexual assault statistics, which which is a double whammy. Um, uh, it's a double whammy because Sweden actually has good sexual assault reporting, and a lot of other countries don't. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's it's actually an unfair comparison. Um, but. but <laughs> It is an unfair comparison, and I've been working with during the refugee crisis. I worked mm-hmm. with uh, single coming refugee kids in Sweden mm-hmm. full time for like five years almost. Uh, yeah, I know this is a big passion of yours. So, would you like to talk yeah, a little bit about I, how those statistics are misused? I mean, they are misused, but but the Swedish left who are as the Swedish left, liberal left, which are basically Democrats by oh, okay. by another name. Uh, what are they called in Sweden? Oh, we we have a bunch of parties. We have the Green Party, which is basically ne- neoliberals but feminist and who like refugees and are. So yeah, that's isn't that true in most of Europe that the Green Party is neoliberal feminists who like refugees and hate nuclear power. Yeah, basically. Okay, uh, and then we have the form. Communist Party, which is basically what the social what the social democrats were ten years ago. <laughs> that sounds normal. I mean, I mean, not, yeah. uh, like, well, our Communist Party was basically what <laughs> what the Democrats were in the late thirties. But anyway, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. but but uh, yes. Yeah, so that's pretty normal. The social democrats, which are neoliberal machine. And then we have the former, which which now has swift sides from the right to the left because they refuse to work with the so with Swedish Dem- Democrats, and that is the center party, the former former farmer party, which in the early and they were literal Nazis in the thirties and forties. But the Swedish uh, Democrats are too too national conservative for them. Uh, yeah, because during the nine. 90- 
90s and the early 2000s, the Center Party uh, was basically hijacked by uh, Timbru, uh, which is the former, which is the Swedish response to the Heritage Foundation. So basically, a bunch of young people who are libertarians, like Rand Paul. Like, yeah, yeah. A, I have noticed there's a lot of Swedish libertarians, yes. Yeah. And, and they are real libertarians. Uh, and they have clung to the guns in like, we defend sexual rights and HBTQ people. And... Okay, so in the American, so I was just explaining it to Americans. I don't know how this is going to translate to the rest of Europe. They're the libertarians who work for Reason Magazine as opposed to all the libertarians who became Trumpists. Got it. Yeah, um... yes, exactly. <laughs> Uh, and they have now switched from the left co- from the right coalition to the left coalition in the last. So, like the Liberal year. Democrats in the UK who go back and forth depending on the yeah, year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. Okay. Uh, but like to go back to the question of sexual assault, because I mean, this is a major parking point in the American far right, and they use yeah. Sweden over and over again. Yeah, and like. That, Sexual assault in Sweden isn't worse than in other countries. We have better reporting. But the fact that it changed nature after the refugee crisis is unfortunately true. And like, because, and think for yourself, I had a lot of young men, boys, who were like 17 or 15 years, who came from rural Afghanistan who basically had never, never seen a woman outside of the house until they came to Sweden. And they couldn't read. And then you put them in, in barracks, like 50 person at a time. And there were one year, two year waiting list to get into school and they couldn't read. And you give them swimming lessons without any no, no language. And then you put teenage boys who basically never seen a woman uh, outside of a hijab in a swimming house with girls in bikinis and no introduction. That does, that's, yeah, that'll be a problem. That will be a problem, especially if you say that most of these young boys, because it was primarily boys who came here, have PTSD, severe PTSD, because they have seen their friends and families be killed in front of them and tortured. And Sweden has the worst uh, psychiatrical treatment in like Western Europe for a variety of reasons. And oh, that sounds like a whole topic in and of itself because I didn't yeah. know that. Uh, right. Yeah, uh, and. These single coming children, refugees were by law allowed to get psychiatric help, but in practice, none of them get. Got it. Basically, there, you, you, you don't even have the people who speak the right languages, right? Like you wouldn't have a bunch of people who speak Pasto or. Uh... Yeah, we did. Okay, actually. you do. Okay. Yeah, uh, that's just because of the weird weird new public men's war between different sector, sections of the privatized psychiatry and healthcare system and the school system, which are all on different levels of government. Okay, so so can you explain to me uh, how, I know Americans and I am familiar with how Swedish education works because it's a big libertarian talking point and yep. school reform as a, some people even some even liberals would pick it up. Hey, this is a way we could use, do school reform fairly because because unlike in America, it would it, the the allotment per student is set, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. Yeah, um, it is. Uh, but the but the schools still get to pick their like if there are more pupils applying for a school, the the private schools still get to pick the students. Right, so you have you have cream, what we call creaming in American education, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we have 
extreme segregation in our educational system, much worse than other Euro European countries. Uh, I think that France and Great Britain are worse in segregation, but that's but that's almost not sure if they are worse anymore. Okay, so again, that makes you a lot more like the United States. <laughs> um, yes. yes. Um, so, like so, our charter school system was drawn up by Milton Friedman <laughs> and implemented. By the Social Democrats. No, uh, no, to their defense, the Social Democrats voted against it. Okay. Uh, it, it was the Green Party who thought that, hey, it will only be some nice, nice parent-run cooperatives and drove it through with the right-wing parties. Oh, in, so in the nineties. So, so the in the nineties, it it got driven through, but the, the the Social Democrats had to implement it. Yeah. Oh man, that's a nightmare. All right. Um, and the social democrats are married to it now. Okay, so they would they they're not gonna get rid of it. No. All right, but how does Swedish healthcare work? Because people don't realize socialist healthcare works very differently in every country I've ever been in. Um, okay. so is it semi privatized? Is it private insurance? It's it's not like the British system, is it? Like, what, what are we talking about here? We have you universal and free healthcare, yeah. Um, but uh, there are many countries that have universal health care that's yeah. free or close to free that it's still private. Like you have to pay like uh, 20, uh, 10 to 20 euros per visit. But if your visits per year draws up and your medicine draws up to over uh, seven, uh, what is it, like uh, 100 and 100, one zero, one. Seven zero euro, euros. The rest is free, so that's the top. Even okay. for medication, uh, and then the states cover it. Covers it, uh, but uh, psi, uh, but mental health is barely included at all. And well, in Sweden, our schools and most our social services are 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 driven at the municipal levels and funded at the municipal levels. The state so level... Again, like America. Okay, go yeah. ahead. And the state level only has basically the military, the a court system, all court systems though, and uh, the migration uh, agencies and some, uh, some social insurance. Not so, all it's actually weirdly familiar. Like this is strangely like the U.S. Um, yeah, and then we have a middle, um, a middle ground which is called regions. Okay, so like our county system. Go on. Yeah, uh, uh, but much bigger than your country system. More like your state system. Okay, so they're like provinces and other. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. And basically, the only thing they do is that they drive the healthcare. And so your healthcare is regional? Yeah. That's weird. All that's right. really weird. So it's not municipal nor federal, because that's no. normally how it's done. Okay. Yeah. But and and they have a separate tax and they found and they have to fund all all healthcare, even the private. And then private companies and they and they primarily do like uh, uh, small health clinics because that's all that that is like revenue and profit in. Like it isn't profitable to treat uh, cancer patients or severe illnesses. So they leave that to the uh, big hospitals. And the big hospitals are almost all run by, by the regions. But the small healthcare centers are basically run by for-profit big companies who are who are owned by uh, by basically uh, risk capitalists. Uh, so this is so this is a true neoliberal model where you have a yeah. section of the economy that is not marketized to the customer yeah. but is marketized to the state. But the 
but the gains go into private investors' hand. Yeah. Okay. Oh God. That's yeah. a, that's a, and ooh. and most of these companies, and this is also true for for the schools, are like written in Panama or in Dubai, so they don't pay Swedish taxes. So your social safety net is actually uh, it is actually truly a net drain in your economy unless it's going oh, to the yeah. regional hospital. And like, oh god, that's and that that, that is a nightmare that is, design. Yeah, that 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 is a nightmare design. And You'd almost be better off having truly free capitalist stuff. Yeah, honestly. yeah, yeah. And so, like, we have billions of tax payer funded ed- education and healthcare money who is going untaxed into the hands of billionaires. Or we have some really nice Islamic schools who basically fund ISIS <laughs> through these weird schemes. Oh, so, so okay. So this, so this would lead to a total to like, and this would be particularly problematic in mental health because it can't be formed out to the regional hospitals. It's going to be in these... Like charter health yeah, centers, yeah. And like due to Swedish weird personalization uh, and uh, and it and it is on crisis with uh, like a big scandal with re- with repressed memories in Sweden during the 1990s. So wait, you had a you had a, you had a satanic panic too, but like no, later. It, no, uh, with with us it, it was a pure incest panic. Oh, so so. So you had the sex scare part of it, but no devil. Yeah. So the secular satanic panic fit. Yeah. Oh God. Okay. Uh, uh, well, so so th- this is a side note for all my friends that, who think in secular society that all that weird shit's gonna go away. You're wrong. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, because you cannot find a more secular so- society in in the world than Sweden. And that is because we are so, we we had stayed Lutheran, Calvinist, shoved down our throat for 500 years. You're almost making the reactionary argument that the Protestant Reformation is what led to secularism, although it's a reactionary argument that I happen to actually believe. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, okay, to come out with my colors, I... Uh, I I am a Catholic. I am not. I, I know. I know you. I know you're a Catholic communist. <laughs> you're a Catholic communist. Um, yeah. And uh, you're also uh, you were associated with a with a Trotskyist party at one point, correct? Yeah. Uh, mm, yeah. Uh, not anymore. Uh, but uh, but for a long time. Like, and I I was a member of the Green Party uh, in my early twenties. Like, I was the youngest person elected to the municipal board. In Gothenburg, which is Swedish next largest city ever, for the Green Party, for, for the Green Party. Okay. Uh, so I basically run. I I was in the major, majority of the of of the municipal council of Swedish next largest city who run all the social services. Uh, I I help get people elected to uh, uh, to the Reichstag to your Senate. Okay, yeah. so just to clear out, but for, for no one's calling you a secret classic reactionary, but I don't want him to start. Um, uh, that's fine. I'm were fine you Catholic that. at the time? No. Ah, I can't defend you. Okay, no. <laughs> no. Because like I became a Catholic, like when I first started to go to church, I was like 17 years old, and I told my my parents that I want to play in a punk band. Mm-hmm. When I was going to church because they wouldn't allow me to go to church. Okay, so your so parents were teenage, teenage rebellion, and then in my mid twenties, I became a Catholic. Okay, so you were you were a teenage rebellious Catholic. You're still, but you're still a leftist. But but oh. I, I I point this out because it's I think I think the comparison that Sweden had an incest. Repress memory panic just like the united states but the only difference is no demons 
which yeah. would actually make it even harder to discredit because in yeah. America we can at least go, you don't really believe there were demons, right? Like, mm. um, but the repressed memory hyst uh hysteria is a sexist word, but you know what I mean. Um the, 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 the repressed memory panic in its association with sexual violence is almost identical. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I actually did know that, but I didn't know that it didn't have any demon stuff in it. No, so it, no, no, like it was basically all my dad touched me in a bad way, and later it came out that they didn't. And it was all repression, yeah, it was press memories, it was leading. It's the yeah. same stuff that happened in the US yeah. 10 years earlier, but it, when we did it, earlier. it had That's devils. The difference in Sweden because Swedish mental health care was state owned, the backslash became much much harsher and oh that's... so this went back on the state health care se- oh yeah. god and, so and... so those dirty socialist health care exactly. led to a whole lot of false oh that see that's a nightmare scenario i can't imagine if that happened in the united states but yeah. but and that... i just want to illustrate the point that secularization and rationality are not related <laughs> like... no, no 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 uh it's probably the opposite way around uh uh, but this led to a big backslash against that. So the medical community turned it back upon upon therapy, basically. So basically, for the the whole odds, it was basically impossible to get therapy uh, if you didn't pay for it out of your own pocket, and nobody can afford that. Uh, uh, so what you get instead was antidepressive drugs and that was all mental health treatment that you were able to get mm. and that's so again you know, similar to the united states i'm seeing a lot of parallels here yeah where... but like the difference is in the united states for for the upper middle classes you you can get your yeah, yeah. You, you, the upper, the yeah. upper middle classes can pay to be can pay to be essentially good Europeans. <laughs> exactly, but in Sweden that wasn't an option. Oh, so so you have the standard for everyone, for but but it's truly equal. <laughs> yeah, God, th- this is funny. This would be discrediting the socialism in a lot of ways. Yeah, uh, well, like. This is mostly to do with compromises that the social democrats made with the state apparatus. Right, right. No, clearly. But it's compromises that would make the social democrats doing things with the state apparatus that they compromise less popular. Like, like it's a it's yeah. a negative feedback loop, right? Like yeah. and yeah. the thing is that the right wing parties, and they have officially stated this, their goal since the 1980s have been to run down, to to cut funding for public services so that they become worse for everybody and say, hey, these services are crap. And yeah, then, so, so the American strategy. Are, yeah. are, are, the, are, are actually the Tories probably actually invented it. Yeah, but, but... and the Tories stole that from, like, David Cameron's inspiration was, was Friedrich Eintet. Oh, so you, yes. So, so here, hey, this is funny. I've been noticing a feedback loop between the American right and the European right, mm-hmm. where the American right will take a bad, actually a bad European liberal idea, mm-hmm. make it worse. Then the uh, then then the uh, the European right will mm-hmm. pick it up and do it even worse. And yeah. then the American right will pick up the European right idea. So it's like gone through this weird figure eight and gotten worse each time yeah um so like for example the school charter movement and school testing movement was actually not even based off the swedish system it was based off the british system under tony blair that they implemented in texas then it was nationalized in the aughts under george bush and who was tony blair influenced by the Swedish is... finance minister Shell Olof Felt. Bingo. So, but then, but then the Tories and the Swedish right pick up the American version to make it even shittier, and we'll probably pick it up again. So, I mean, it's like there's like a there's like an enclosed like ecosystem of bad ideas. Here. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and 
and there is a really good Swedish uh, uh, political sci scientist, Jen Jenny Andersson. I think some of her books are translated into English, actually. And she has argued that for a large part of the late 20th century, uh, 21st century, the European left looked to Sweden as an alternative. Be because Sweden made some interesting experiments with driving democratic socialism. Right. In incorporating Keynesian and Marxist models together, exactly. um, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. But when, when the basically the, the, the neoliberal school of economics, Kansli Hushagen, as we call them in Sweden, uh, took over the social democrats during the late 80s. Uh, basically what happened was that uh, they incorporated Milton Friedman's ideas plus some, some weird form of universality uh, and, and a strong state who financed it all. And then- So you, so you invented neoliberal social democracy? Yeah. All right. The two things that American leftists don't think can even happen together. But what terrifies me is, mm -hmm. <laughs> is the American model mm -hmm. for social democracy that you hear prompted by people like Bernie Sanders and uh, the center of, of the DSA, mm -hmm. uh, as, as opposed to the DSA right or the DSA left, um, is based largely on contemporary Scandinavia, a mixture of Sweden, Nor uh, Norwich, uh, Nor Norwegian, and Danish ideas all together. Yeah, and like, and I think that it is really good to look at Norway, actually. Okay. Uh, because Norway made the same thing that Sweden did up until the uh, late uh, middle of the aughts. Uh, when the social democrats basically were co-opted by some union operatives. Uh, and they didn't become left economically, but what they did was that they started a war on new public management. So they have experimented with public sector uh, and tried to get away from this hellish system where the public school have to contract public janitors to to screw in a light bulb <laughs> and so on and so forth hmm. so there have been some very interesting stuff happening in norway or there were for a 10 year per per period uh, i think that a lot of that has gone away but one should look closer at that. And also, the left is, is stronger in, uh, in the social democrats in Norway never picked the second international, uh, uh, the, the second international. They, the social democrats in Norway were also in between internationals. Mm. Because they were too left for the second international, but they were too right wing for the, uh, or basically too anti colonial for the uh, Moscow international, because they have just broken out of being a Swedish colony, which happened 1917. Mm, okay. No, 1915. 1915. So there's only two years between them being a Swedish colony and them being an independent country. Yeah. Got it. So, so, so they also were independent from either uh, international. Okay. Yeah, and also they were occupied by Nazi Germany, and the and the left wing of the Social Democrats in uh, in Norway basically did did what Tito did and monopolized the resistance, which led to the fact that they had all the moral credibility. After, okay. After this, after the Second World War, they they didn't manage to to build up a political he, hegemony as the Social Democrats did in in Sweden or Denmark, but 
they were too left for that to play out purely game theoretical. But instead, they maintained a strong left and and uh, kept the right wing out. So basically, Norway was run by left liberals who couldn't go to the right because of the threat from a radical social dem- dem- democratic party. Hmm. Okay. Well, that so. So, so that is part of why the Norwegian left, at least, has fared a little better. Yeah. But an an American who's trying to base policies off of a kind of basket of these three states, and particularly in the American context, under actually under different economic theories too, because they try to justify this out from a mixture of Marxism and modern monetary theory, not classical Keynesianism. Um, it would it would be really strange and incoherent, and still. I think prone to certain neoliberal reforms being easily able to be snuck back in. Yeah, yeah, because of the fact that, and and this is something that socialists have to, and the left more general have to grapple with. The reason why Sweden was able to neoliberalize everything so easy was that everything was owned by the state. I see. If you look at Germany, for for our example, they they have not been able to ne- neoliberalize their labor market because of the fact that they, that it was never incorporated into the state. It 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 was built up by hundreds of guilds who kept their strong material bases outside of the government. You've actually answered the question for me that I've never been able to explain which was why were the stronger social democratic governments, even in places in Latin America, yeah. the ones that were more able to rapidly neoliberalize as opposed, like they could do things Pinochet could not do even with the Chicago boys. Exactly. Like, and if you look at the rest of, of Europe, they had separated the church from the states. Mm. In Sweden, that wasn't the case. Uh, which led to, if you look at Germany, there, there, their social services are run by churches. They are official. They they they, they are financed by the state, uh, but they are uh, administrated by 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 churches and and unions who 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 cannot be bossed around by the state in in the same way because they have the their power power gravity in civil society and not in the states hmm. and in Sweden there was literally no power center outside of the state and the free market so and the free market in Sweden was monopolized by a few large industries and that was a part of the of the social democratic compromise that that we will try to destroy small companies and middle Size companies to bring them into large companies, basically the health reading school. Right, the Hilferding School Monopoly Capital. Oh, exactly. That was a nightmare in Germany, though. Yeah, but in Sweden it worked. Ah, okay. And but... in Sweden, that was like basically it was, yeah, the old gentry families. Who like basically, yeah, sure, we would love to own everything. No problem for us. <laughs> and the social dem and the social democrats helped help them through unions to crush the opposition. And in return, the monopoly capital helped the social democrats to crush the left opposition within the unions and also to to crush unions who weren't offic- officially affiliated with the Social Democratic Party. So basically, to put it in classical Marx terms, which is illuminating to me, but not to anyone else, um, uh, Sweden proves that LaSalle really was wrong. Yeah. Like, the dictatorship of the proletariat is not just nationalizing everything and stopping there. You have to do a lot more. And Mm -hmm. if you don't, your bourgeoisie will basically become part of the state apparatus and uh, got it. So 
Um, this, and, this yeah, and, and to bring this back to today, if you add like this neoliberalization, which lead to a dysfunction of the public services and goods, which are like the right wing has said this officially in their uh, writings that we want to make all public services so dysfunctional so that the middle classes will have no choice but to privatize them totally because that's the only way we can build support for dismantling the welfare state mm. Because if they're dysfunctional, you have to completely privatize them. Yeah. And thus neoliberalism becomes a mechanism for ordo liberalism or the return exactly. to completely privatized really. Got it. All and, right. Uh, and, that's that's terrifying, but I also see it in my home country, so it makes yeah. sense. So and um, if you bring that like this extreme demographic shift, which I mentioned in in the beginning, from like zero point zero zero seven per percent of the population who came from outside of like Scandinavia, Germany and the Netherlands till and to in the 60s and today we have like we don't really know uh, the best educated guesses from researchers are between 25 and 45 percent who have like some sort of mixed heritage from outside of Europe in in 60 years, mm -hmm. in these 60 years, we have seen at the height of the 80s, the, the difference between the richest person in Sweden and, uh, and an industrial worker was 11. So an industrial worker in Sweden, uh, there, there was 11 industrial workers salaries to make up the salaries of this gentry C COO. So not much of an income disparity. Super low Gini coefficient. Yeah. Yeah. Today the we have seen like to to the absolute top it is like something like 500. Well that's still low compared to here. But but yes. Like... Yeah but like this has been in 30 years. That's crazy, though. I mean, like, like you basically in thirty years, in, in, in one generation, mm. have gone from what we still think Sweden is, yeah, to something like because of your social democratic base, your society mm. is still slightly more functional, yeah. But uh, and you haven't you haven't had the worst of the neoliberal nightmarescape, but it looks like it's coming, yeah. Like, it it, it is, and if you add to that, like, from being an extremely ethnically homogeneous country, which mm -hmm. is extremely secular, like, uh, like, much more secular than the most urban places in New York. Well, yeah, I mean, but that's, that's, uh, I, I'm trying to think of, like, like the most secular countries I know of are like Sweden and Czech and and Czechia and like that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's those are, um, so so the idea that and even I used to have it the idea that uh that secularity would be a bulwark against neoliberalization because neoliberalization would use the uh, the 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 old conservative social forms to stop any any state development it, it's, it's becoming clear to me and in this conversation is not what's doing i've been thinking about it for years but it's yeah. become clear to me that that's not true yeah that... no, uh, rather the opposite because most of these neoliberal reforms were were done on on woke uh uh on woke ar argumentation the the charter school system the idea was that teachers who are primarily women would be able to choose their employer and therefore get higher wages. And the same thing with the uh, work with with healthcare work personnel or social care personnel, which of course never happened. <laughs> like the opposite has happened. Uh, not for teachers, but for healthcare personnel, there 
wages have gone down. Uh, teacher has gone up, but that's because of other reasons. Uh, so, and so, like, most of these neoliberal reforms were done by, like, uh, we will have strong female entrepreneurs a la Lena Dunham. Oh, so it's like bourgeois feminism yeah. was a lot of the reform. Yeah. <sighs> okay. Well, that's depressing. Um, not surprising. I mean, if you've studied the history of these things, most of the... So, what I tell people, mm -hmm. actually... And I, I say this as a person who thinks cultural and cultural apparatus is actually far more important and even part of the, quote, base of production than people realize. But when I tell people, if you start seeing people argue for conservative economic policies off of progressive cultural norms, at first it will seem like they deliver the progressive cultural norms. I mean, and capitalism for gender, for example, in, in the first half of the 20th century actually looks pretty good. But... And in Sweden, it has, it has actually been for quite many women as well. Uh, like, not all of them. Like, the thing is, uh, women, the women who works in service sector, which is huge in Sweden, because el elderly care and, and daycare centers in Sweden are universal. Uh, and Oh, that sounds real nice, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's real nice. Uh, mm -hmm. And the social democrats did that right, uh, but that was also uh, that that was a way to force women out of civil society. Be, because Gunnar Myrdal, the architect of this, basically said that women have to be incorporated into the state that apparatus because otherwise they will have these weird romantic notions of family. And we cannot have that. So therefore, the state has to crush those sentimental views of, of family and dependence and care. So we make it professional instead. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so 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 there. So what we're looking at is the double-edged swords of, of of liberal progressive capitalism. Like yeah. it really does deliver some of the of the social advances, but it comes at a cost in other areas that we don't often think about replicating yeah, exactly. in our, in our social advocacy. Exactly. And that's so important. We see actually, and during the, during neoliberalism, the last, which basically is heading towards some sort of an end mm -hmm. uh, because of global supply chains and the geopolitical uh, situation. But, uh, but the heyday of neoliberalism in Sweden was basically 2006 to 2016. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but but what replaces neoliberalism will not probably be, be the old. Uh, it will, will be something much, much worse, much uh, yeah. worse. Uh, Which we, I think we're seeing everywhere. <laughs> the, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, like. Neoliberalism it, didn't have to end in communism, people. It could end no, in something no, bad. No, no, no. <laughs> In a couple of years, we will look back on our toxic ex, which is neoliberalism. Perhaps he wasn't so bad after all. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I feel that way because I, 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 I go back and I, re, you know, my I read a lot of Christopher Lash, um, mm. and he's talking about Fordism, and a lot of people read him as talking about neoliberalism, but they're not looking at the time period in which he's writing. Yeah. And I'm like, isn't it funny that a lot of the complaints we make about neoliberalism? We were making about post-war Fordist um, economic planning and its revitalization of elements of capitalism, too. And in fact, as I pointed out um, with uh, my friend Stefan Hamill, a lot of our ways of discussing what's going on in neoliberalism are actually based off of the political economy of the Fordist 50s and 60s yeah. um, and then projecting those class relations onto neoliberal class relations without thinking about it. Yeah. Um, but like, yeah. yeah. And, uh, well, uh, one thing that, that is important to have in mind as well is that since Sweden's universities are free, mm. they are, which is 
great. There are no two tuition fees and you get five years of student loans free from the state. That, so you can afford to live in uh, rent a cheap apartment and buy your literature uh, at very good conditions for five years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in combination with that and the large educational gaps uh, merit gaps between men and women, which are common everywhere. But since Sweden has such a universal uh, educational system, it becomes more pronounced here mm-hmm. because it is more of a mer- mer- meritocracy. Like I, I have spoken to like some some doctor students and some uh, students of doctors or like this top which you only get into if you have the highest score in every subject mm-hmm. in the class of 50 people there are like three or four men so kind of like what we see in the united states but way more accelerated exactly and if you add to that that neoliberalism has actually led to the fact that uh, for women who belong to to the upper echelons, it is much easier to make a career. And these educational gaps are are beginning to show in in the younger generation of bosses in both public and private services, mm-hmm. uh, where men are pushed out because of because of the the, the education gap. Not to the extent that women and men, like it is not proportional to merit, but we are still see, seeing a major shift. So we so we are seeing a major shift in in gender balance there, uh, in combination with the drastic uh, ethnic and demographic shifts shift in Sweden the, the last sixty years, and the neoliberalization. And the fact that public services has become, by design, much worth at, at delivering goods. Mm. This, yeah, you you see that this is heading towards something really bad. Do you guys have an incel problem? I mean, yeah, we do. Okay, uh, but like we don't have. We you don't have, have it like we do. Or so, like it's actually people don't realize this is a big problem in Japan and South Korea right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But. I mean, Japan and South Korea are the biggest one. Like in Sweden, like we have it, but like not to that extent at all. Got uh, it. And like one thing that is good with Sweden, like we have only had one school shooting in our history, and that wasn't even a real school shooting. Like it was the right wing extremists who sh- right extremists in self four or five years ago, who turned up at his school with a long sword. Mm. Uh, so, like, because it's very hard to get a hold of weapons here, le- legally. Like, it's, Even though the right likes your universal militia policy, but... Yeah, but, like, that's not, like... That was... We only had that in theory up until, like, 2000 and and five it, yeah we, but but we we're slow to pick up on new political developments in sweden Man. yeah like but like in practice it was abolished like in the 80s don't tell don't tell reason magazine okay um yeah. so like, um, we have a highly professionalized army much more professionalized than yours hmm. uh much smaller now, but we will see a difference to that. And and that is something that the social democrats now are re- regretting. Like during, during the 70s, we had the third largest air fleet of, uh, of fighter jets in the world. Mm-hmm. In the world. Like only you guys and the Soviet Union had bigger. Mm. Yeah. Like, every man in Sweden had military training. Every man. Uh, if, if you refused, they threw you into prison. 
All right, which is which which even like our our military is pretty highly professionalized, but you're right in the sense that uh, um, most of U.S. society, despite how armed we are, it's not trained. I mean, like, no. um, but that uh, was all all killed in the late '80s and early '90s. So, like, now was that like, based off of like NATO? Was that based off the idea that because you weren't, even though you weren't in NATO, you were surrounded by NATO, that you didn't need it anymore? No, no, no. I think it was largely like the end of history narrative, in 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 combination with the fact that the social democrats had to to rely on the Green Party, and the Green Party wanted to cut down on the military, and instead of doing in environmental shit, they could like, yeah, we can save money here. So like it was purely so, so yeah so so everywhere in the world I just want to point this out the Green Party doesn't get its actually useful environmental agenda done, but it does get <laughs> yeah other like the, cultural stuff done that may have repercussions later yeah yeah like 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 basically the Green Party in Sweden have made four things they have basically not alone but they were not part part of it they. Together with, with with the left party, the the former communist, abolished the Swedish mil, 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 military. They had made it impossible to 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 build to build out our nuclear uh, mm. capacity, uh, nuclear energy. They have uh, introduced charter schools and introduced charter schools in in elderly care and primary health care. Hmm. Those are their big reforms. That's lovely. All right. Yeah. Um, I so, fucking hate them. <laughs> <laughs> so I have one last question, and then we'll wrap up for today. You will probably be back on uh, in the future, as who knows what's going to happen in Scandinavia, uh, particularly Sweden. Yeah, now we, have... we are having an election this uh, this year. Yeah, and I, I'm wondering. I I know the prime minister put. Is it is pushing back on the popular sentiment to join NATO? So I was going to ask you, yeah. how likely is it that Sweden joins NATO, or at least encourage, or, or encourages Germany and France to create an all-European defense force outside of NATO and joins it? Uh, so the Europeans have been pushing, and the the, the Swedes want the European uh, defense. Or the social democrats want the European style, right? And, so, and they have been pushing for that for for a while. So they are not pushing against militarization; they're just pushing against militarization under U.S. auspices yeah. through NATO. Got yeah. it. Uh, but the right wing parties in Sweden, both the major right wing, the moderates, and the Swedish dem, the Swedish Democrats now. They changed overnight to against NATO to for NATO like one week ago. Uh, ah, yes. Uh, and Plausible like, deniability. Got it. Yeah. Kind of like yeah. Orban and going back and forth in Hungary on how, how he's going to relate to Russia like every exactly. day. Exactly. Uh, but so basically, if the Social Democrats lose this election, we will join NATO. Do that. Puts me rooting for the very bastards we've been talking about how much they suck for two hours. Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, yeah, be, because the right wing want to join NATO. Uh, the Social Democrats? How likely are the Social NATO. Democrats to, are to lose? What? I mean, they have a pretty strong hold. I mean, they've only really lost completely once, but... but no, how like I mean, they, 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 they lost completely 2006. Okay, so twice. So the 70s and then again in the late 2000s. Yeah, but in okay. 2006, they lost their monopoly on power because then they lost again the election after that. And <laughs> since then, they have been in government, but they have not had a stable coalition, but, but had to rely on right-wing parties mm. in order to keep the Swedish Democrats out. So is the fear of the Swedish Democrats going to be enough to keep the center party or any of the other right right wing parties from joint making a coalition against the against the uh, 
under the conditions of uh, of uh, Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine. Exactly. That's very uh, hard to say. So we... It, it, so if you want to venture a prediction, I won't either because I... Uh, no, no, because like basically the social dem, dem, democrats here have very little to show for what they have done the last years, just as, as Biden. But the difference is that they have been in power for like eight years now. As opposed to two. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and I, to be fair, I also predict... I don't, I'm not going to make any predictions about about two, uh, 2024, because who the fuck knows? It, every yeah, exactly. year has been crazy. But I am willing to make a prediction about 2022. Mm. Um, the I think the Democrats still lose the House of Representatives here. Yeah. And, and and they might, might keep the Senate by the skin of their teeth, but it is, but it it is, it it is literally so close for me looking at conventional measures mm. and so hard for me to game unconventional ones that I that it's like 50 50 on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I say that, yeah, I say that because I think a lot of countries are like that, except where there's where, where during COVID you had consolidations of power, like in the mm. UK, like I, I, I mean, even though Johnson is increasingly unpopular and no one really likes the Tories, it's hard for me to imagine labor ever being serious. Well, labor is permanent opposition party. And that's always been like, they like labor has only been in power twice. No, three right. times. Three times. Yeah. Although it did have a long stretch of power in the 60s into the middle 70s. But yes, yes, um, you're right. They it, are it, permanent opposition party. Um, uh, but like to return to your question about NATO, what will the social democrats do? Uh, I is think, there a division within the social democrats? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, that's more interesting. Let's, let's uh, talk about that. And... I don't know which which faction will 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 be winning out. The because the Swedish populists right now are really anti-Russians. Like, like even former pacifist communists like want to go to war. <laughs> and I think I think this is something that American leftists cannot fathom. That there be that even like parts of the center of 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 Europe, uh, not France. It's hard to read Germany, but mm. a whole lot of Central Eastern Europe are really, really kind of wanting a fight with Russia as long as yeah. it's not a nuclear war. Like yeah, exactly, and the Social Democrats. It's very hard to see what they will do, but like basically, the public wants us to. A large portion of the public wants us to join NATO now. Hmm. Uh, and it is a question if that sentiment dies down. It is a, if it doesn't, then 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 the fucking hawks in the social democrats will win. Because yeah, that's what I was asking. Because I know the prime minister's pushing back on it. Not not for demilitarization or remaining the same, but on the hopes that Germany and France can build a European coalition army outside of NATO, which, yeah. which both could easily happen, by the way. Like, if I kind of think both are at, not that you guys join NATO, but both that NATO arms up, but that also the EU starts spending money on its own defense in a real way and, and having a real, uh, Absolutely. real, EU yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, we, we Sweden will go up to two percent of PMP. And, and here's what I here's what I have told people that people have not and, liked. And, and one more thing about NATO: it isn't completely up to us. If Finland joins join NATO, we will as well. All right. Yeah. So that, that's another one. So, but but I do have this one thing I want to point out. Mm -hmm. um, the conservative argument that Europe has not had to pay for its own defense, and thus mm -hmm. its social democracies have not had to make real cost trade-offs is actually true. I know I, I know that people don't like it when I say it, but it's true. And so it has been true for Sweden since since like the late 80s, but like during the whole post-war period. No, Sweden, no, but 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 that during the post-war period you guys were still kind of truly independent. Yeah. And then Sweden and the, which were like the most developed welfare state then. 
mm-hmm. in in Europe had really really big defense. So that argument doesn't really hold water. That there is an absolute correlation there. Mm. Because I would think that a genuine draft, which involves everybody, which it did in Sweden, every map, from gentry to 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 serfs, be, because we had serfs for quite a long time in Sweden. Uh, like I knew people whose parents were serfs. Like sure, they are in their sixties or seventies now, but still. Uh, but if but if you have a genuine draft who involves everybody, it is quite hard to. But I don't see that as. Do you think that's what? Uh, no, what an EU defense system would be? Because like I also have told people like, look, like if we all have military training, I'm against the state. I'm against this. People don't get this. I'm against it. I don't like the, I, in the long run, I'm a Marxist. I don't believe in the immediate collapse of state, but in mm-hmm. the long run, I want to unwrap down state power. However, um, I will say that while the draft was a horror in America and it really was, um, yeah. uh, you are less likely to have stupid little wars when there, when, when there's a civilian, when there's a bunch of civilians in the army. Yeah, um, there, absolutely. And uh, like, if you have, uh, like, the draft in the U.S. and Sweden can cannot be compared because you invaded Vietnam and invaded right. Kur- and, 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 invade, Korea. and fought and and did protections in Korea, etc. and so forth. And it was very, yeah. it was a horrible situation. Yeah, but, but like, in Sweden we had a a genuine draft that involved everyone, and uh, and I do think that it is very hard to. Uh, legitimize great social disparities with that kind of draft. I mean, well, the draft is probably what ended segre, like what began to weaken segregation in the United States. There's a reason why that happened. And in Sweden, it was very much a part of the of the fight for democracy and the common vote. Uh, was, was was like one 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 man one gun one boat, uh, mm. and that was introduced in 1917 in Sweden for gen, 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 general suffrage for for men under the threat of revolution, uh, and we had a small rev, revolution in the north. A couple of hundred people died, uh, and then. The first ele- when when the social democrats and the liberals got the, got power, the first thing they did basically was to to extend the, the franchise to women. So it was uh, in, implemented in uh, 1921. Mm. So it was very short disparity, but there. I mean, like the United States still technically has a draft, but we, you, I, I think we'd have to literally be. Pretty much nuke to invoke it. Yeah. Um, uh, like, so it's very hard to like in 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 the hellscape which is the U.S. with your death of despair, opium epidemic, and rampant poverty. Like it's really hard to motivate. Like what? Why, why the fuck should I die for this country? Like it's really hard to mo- to motivate that. Right. Well, I mean, I, again, and I, I'm not a nationalist. I don't want people to die for any country. But I do think, one, universal military training. Hell, I would even extend it to all people, not just all men, um, is not a bad idea. Um, and two, um, it, it is one of the few times that expo- it, in American life, hmm. the places where classes actually interact, sometimes in big public schools, but that's increasingly rare. And then it's like we don't have that here anymore. I know, and I know you don't. And, and uh, but the other times um, are like in Las Vegas, yeah, like which not conditions where you really would want. So I, I do think there's that. I'm also, you know, I, I I'm also not I I'm not against conscientious objectors being able to go into a civil corps, you know, like at all. But um. 
But I also think like, okay, you want you want an answer to a whole lot of problems. Well, why do why are our monopolies and militias and all that stuff so scary in the United States? And it's because also like most of us are not capable of of really defending ourselves in those situations. And you have a lot of guns. Yeah, but we no. don't have a lot of people who know how to use them. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm serious about that. So it's it's like, yes, we have we have so many guns that, that our neighboring countries can't really pass gun laws because it'll still get in. But yeah. um, I mean, they have gun laws. It just doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, but like I I would like to add like because you spoke of segregation there and between classes, and I think that that is really important uh, for people to understand how segregated Sweden is there, because Sweden is much more segregated than I think the US is uh, on, on class, uh, because of the fact that we have these charter schools, mm -hmm. and that leads to the fact that like outside of work, we don't have any social arenas. Sport is not a big thing here anymore. So people only interact within their own class. There are two exceptions. And that is those few who go to big churches. But like that is, there, are, there aren't really good statistics on this. But the ones I have found is like less than, than half a percent of the of, of Swedish population who regularly go to churches. Mm. It's really small. It's neg it's really negligible. Uh, the other, the only way that people interact over classes I, is over Tinder, I think. Because of the fact that Sweden is is so re relatively small in 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 size of population. Mm -hmm. People who do internet dating can't segregate be, be a class to the extent that you can in other countries. Mm. But people still to a large extent uh, form long relationship com cu coupling to the extent that people still do that uh, within their own class. That's true here too. Yeah, it is very rare for people to, be, which has actually led to part of like the the quote unquote marriage problem here. Mm. Uh, and not that I'm a huge proponent of marriage, but you do see people who are unhappy that they can't find people, and but part of it is because they are class insulated. And uh, uh, I will say that class mobility downwardly in men is pretty common in the United States. Yeah. But and it's downward like, mobility, not upward mobility. Yeah. yeah. So. And, and like in Sweden, like we still, the traditional men, men working class jobs still get good pay, but they are getting few, few, few. There, there are still a lot of them because a lot of them are gilded. Mm. Not gilded, but licensed. Like you have to have license to become an electric and so on and so forth. So it's yeah. very similar. Yeah. So what traditional work, traditional working class jobs in America are largely now uh, have largely been uh, petite bourgeoisified because they're private contractors and they're, yeah. and they're also licensed. Yeah. So not to the extent that it is in the U S but we are but getting there. You are getting there too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but like, so the traditional manly men work are still who don't have education still get quite good pay, but they are getting few, fewer and fewer, and will get fewer and fewer. And women are getting into the economy, and that, that's the problem. Well, I mean, the United States, the trend is right now, oh, increasingly men are not going to college. Hmm. Um, that's a new trend, and it's one that I haven't discussed in the show or like we even really talked about it because it is so new. But it's and, been in the last like five years, you've seen a well, you, you've seen. You've seen a trend of of uh, of fewer and fewer, particularly white, but men in general, uh, going to college for the past decade. But it's like hitting like critical mass. 
but these men are not getting like normal working class jobs. They're essentially a lot of them are stuck in like permanent get work. Mm. Um, and I, I think it's underexplored, but we've been talking for two hours. Thank you, yeah. man, for your time. You'll be back on the show sometime. Um, uh, you also, I mean, you still haven't gotten your Patreon show, but, um, and with that, I'm going to actually announce my Patreons because they haven't done it in a month. So thank you, Mir. And I hope you have a great day. And of course we'll talk, Mir and I have known each other for what, God, five years. Yeah. And like, I actually counted, I have been on the left longer than, than you, even though I am 10 years younger. Yeah, you have, but that's, I mean, okay. For an American I have been on the left for a long time because most people don't stay on the left in the United States for longer than than 10 years, actually, generally. Um, although that may change. We, we have so many people enter the left in the last decade that it's hard to know. Um, but I used to joke that I was an elder leftist by just maintaining and not becoming a liberal after, a, no. you know, five years. But yes, uh, you've been in it longer than me. I entered the left in like 2006, 2007. Yeah, um, and I did it around 2000 around the between the the iraq and afghan war yeah i see interestingly enough i had like a couple of years there when i was like four years when i was a centrist Mm -hmm. not the real centrist but like the dsa type leftist Mm -hmm. Uh, but that's as far right wing as i have gotten and yeah i had about three years of that yeah um but I was on the paleoconservative right. But in America, they were anti-war and they kept their racial politics. They used to keep, I would say this. They, they used, used to. to keep their, pay- their their racial politics quiet, even when you were in it. They don't anymore. But um, that's a complicated subject. All right. Thank you, Mir. And thank you'll you. be back on the show soon. Have a great day. Thank you for calling in so late over there in Sweden. All right. And with that, let me thank my patrons because I still... Uh, Petite bourgeois rent seeker, and I got to do my job on this. So my Khan e Kahanan patrons, so you, the great, those of you in the cons of cons, uh, that is Andy, uh, which I'm going to pronounce that three like it's an Ain, uh, but it might be three D. I don't know. Um, Algorithmist Andrew, uh, Andrew. I'll say just your last initial. Andrew B, Ben H, Brandon F. Brian S, Buddy R, Carl S, Choice Fantastic, Cole C, Daniel W, Habib R, Harrison A, um, Ivan I, Yakim C, Joel H, Justin H, JYC, Kilgore K, Knight of the Sorrowful Face, Marcus G, Marxism Dadism, Mitt G, Nueva, Patrick, Quinn M, Reed R, Rock for Light, Ryan F, Skippy Sue, Stephen A S, Alan A. The GFC draws the repartee West. Thank you, my Connie Kahanans. I did everybody because I don't remember who I've done in the last session. So it's time to do it again for all active $10 patrons. And remember, you can always choose to patronize uh, a Patreon only episode. I tend to do one a month now. Uh, because of all the other episodes I do. Um, uh, and that you can choose it to come on my show and talk to the patrons. You can choose it to um, to have me uh, d- try to get a guest if you can arrange that guest for me. Uh, or um, you can commission a, sh- a, a Varn short or solo uh, as if you help me with the research. But I, I, if it, or, or if it's something you, that I already know, all, all patrons ever get to suggest uh, 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 nailing it down topics. I am going to eventually pick back up both the series on systems theory and the series on anti-imperialism. But it's a lot of reading, people, and all these crises keep happening in the world, and I have to keep up with that too. Like, give me my old stable world back. 
even though it was shitty. All right. Um, and with that, um, uh, we're I'm going to end on the smooth space outro. Have a good night. <laughs>